the number one cause of miscarriage at any age is chromosomal abnormality of the pregnancy. Mm. It's just that the percentage of miscarriages that are chromosomally abnormal gets higher as a woman gets older. Probably by the time a woman is 40, if she has a miscarriage, 80 to 90% of the time, it's because the tissue was chromosomally abnormal. If you think about it, it's nature's way of protecting her against an abnormal pregnancy. Reproductive endocrinologist Dr. Berkeley joins a podcast where he helps to define what exactly infertility is. We chat about the causes of miscarriages and actually how common they are. And we go into the latest developments of what is called carrier testing. So let's do it. Too many days in the darkness without a glimpse of the light. Running tired and broken and scared, but I swear I'll never give up the fight. I see you broken and beat, head pulled down over your eyes. Every party you want to surrender, darling, you were meant to survive. With Dr. Berkeley, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. My pleasure. I am really glad we're having this conversation today because I feel like reproductive health and infertility is a really important topic. And with millennials now making up the largest portion of the population in the country per generation, it's no secret why people are now starting to take more of a general interest into reproductive health. So to start, would you be able to really help us define what exactly infertility is and what symptoms would someone need to be experiencing to be facing infertility? Right, there are many definitions of infertility. Uh, for your insurance company, it's as simple as 12 months of unprotected intercourse without conception. If mm. you're under 35 years old and six months of unprotected intercourse without conception, if you're over 35 years old. Uh, I would say, it also is a problem if the couple perceives it to be a problem. That emotionally, there are some women who really go years before they think it's a problem and say, oh my God, I wonder why I haven't gotten pregnant. And there are other women where if they don't get pregnant the first or second month they try, uh, are very upset and concerned that something's wrong. Mm -hmm. So. There's both a mathematical model as well as an emotional model. And I guess they're both equally important, especially when you consider the insurance company and probably your own definition. Um, yeah. And there's an intention behind it, too. I guess if you're trying to get pregnant and you're unable to do so on the, the time frame that was ex you were expecting, I'm sure that that could lead to some um, anxiety and then some people probably finding their way in your office. Oh, absolutely. And also there's patients who got pregnant in one month on the first child, and now it's four months and they're not pregnant with the second child, and they think it's a problem based on their own experience, not necessarily mm. uh, statistical truth. And is there certain reasons why that happens? Is it just like, is I mean, is it something as simple as like time of year, or is it just as someone gets older, their chances of becoming pregnant are slowly decreasing? Right. Their pregnancy rate may be slowly decreasing, but it's also random chance. Some months are better than other months, and sometimes you get lucky the first time out. And, and you had said that under the age of 35, it's one it's um, one year above 35, it's six months. That's what most insurance companies say. It mm. really doesn't make logical sense because I would think it's more unusual for a young patient not to be pregnant than an older patient. But there's sort of a recognition that older patients have less time to waste. So most insurance companies have their rules written that an older patient can get care sooner. And are, are you finding that there's certain, are there certain quick methods that you can kind of let your patients know on and, and that could help them 
become pregnant, both in men and women? Are there something that somebody approaches you and says, hey, we're having, you know, we, we've been trying, trying, trying for the last four to five months. We don't know what's wrong. Is there anything that you could prescribe to us, not necessarily even like medication wise, but in, in certain maybe uh, health wise, like changing their diet, exercising more? Are there things like that that you would say could be a, a quicker fix without having to go into more of the uh, prescribing of medicine? Right. Uh, the first thing, you know, if, if I that happens to me all the time, uh, someone comes up to me and says that those very words. And my I usually just take a quick history of how they've been trying because are they focused are they having untimed random intercourse and if there's any issue of timing one of the first things i do is uh explain to them how to use the home ovulation predictor kits to get the timing more accurately uh sometimes they just need education that they literally don't understand when the proper time to have intercourse is if you're focused on getting pregnant. And I often go over the basics of general health uh, to make sure they're not smoking cigarettes uh, while they're trying, that alcohol is at a minimum, that uh, clearly they're not using recreational drugs while they're trying to get pregnant. Yeah. Uh, avoiding unpasteurized foods, raw foods, things like that. But in reality, uh, it's rarely an issue of what the couple is doing in their general life. Uh, it's either that they've just been statistically unlucky or that something's actually wrong that won't be discovered till we do formal testing. Okay. What, and what, what type of test would you end up uh, doing with someone when you get a little step further there? Oh, once we're at the testing point, there's four main things that you look at. Obviously, there's many tests out there, but there's four basics that have to be true in order to get pregnant. You need sperm, so you do a semen analysis. About a quarter to a third of the couples we see have some element of male factor. About a quarter, you said? About 25%? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You need normal structure, meaning your uterus has to be normal and your tubes have to be open. So there's an X-ray or a sonogram that can be done that evaluates that the tubes are okay and the uterus is normal. Every physician does that slightly differently, but ultimately it gets accomplished. Mm. You need eggs that can get you pregnant, and there are blood tests that can be drawn on the second and third day of the menstrual cycle that give a general description of egg quality and egg quantity. It's not an exact test. Women whose tests aren't perfect can still get pregnant, but it certainly gives you a hint of whether you think the eggs are involved in the problem or not. Those tests usually become a bigger problem as the woman gets older. And then the fourth thing is ovulation, the monthly release of the egg. Most women who ovulate regularly get their period monthly. Women come in and give a history of irregular periods. They never know when their period's coming. One month it's 25 days and the next month it's 40 days. Often have what we call ovulatory dysfunction, that they're either not ovulating at all, or they're ovulating so irregularly at, or at such long cycle length that they're having trouble timing intercourse correctly. Hmm. Okay, I'd like to just ask you a couple of questions on some of those. The, to start with the very first one, I think um, it's, I feel like uh, People may not think that men have anything to do with fertility, but as you said, 25% before, um, how much of a surprise is that to people? And also, what are some causes that happen that cause men to end up contributing to the infertility? Um, well, there are many people who believe there are environmental factors. Hmm. Uh, there are reports out there that over the course of the last 50 or 100 years, 
the average quality of semen analyses has decreased, particularly in the industrialized world. But there's also what I would call the scrotal temperature theory of why sperm sometimes can be not good. One of the reasons the testes are outside the body in the scrotal sac is that it allows the testes to be below body temperature. Mm -hmm. And anything that raises average, average scrotal temperature theoretically could interfere. There are many columnists in the past who, you know, they had things like boxer shorts versus jockey shorts. I was just going to say that. Right. Uh, some people think, you know, the drivers of 18-wheel trucks sit on the hot engine all day long. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's many men who do it, but if you took a sauna every day or a hot tub every day, things that raise uh, temperature. One thing that raises mean scrotal temperature is obesity. And it may be that the thigh fat that surrounds the scrotum raises the average temperature. And it may not, you know, reduce the sperm count to zero, but it can have effects both subtle and perceived on sperm count, sperm motility, what's called sperm morphology, the shape of the sperm. So there's many things out there. And then more rarely, there are actually genetic reasons. Usually those men have fairly profound abnormalities of sperm count, and they're often taken care of by urologists who specialize in male fertility. Ah, gotcha. I was just I was just thinking that too when you had said people sitting in the trucks, like truck drivers, because oh. people who sit in offices too, their legs are generally closed more than they're open yeah. with long pants and boxers and and yeah. um and yeah. underwear. So like it's in an enclosed section for a good exorbitant amount of time for about eight yeah. hours of the day, and then not including the hour to work and then the hour home where you're also like that as well, which right. people generally, if you think about like yeah. previous to the right. industrial revolution where people are farming and, and working outside, right. they're generally more of a space where they're right. not so heated. That's a very right. good theory. Very interesting too. Right. So I don't know how true it is, but the 18 wheeler is probably different than your office. I hope there's no engine under your chair. In no, your no, no, no. <laughs> but, you know, being being so condensed does, you know, increase or generate heat or at the minimum yeah. doesn't allow them to cool so quickly. So right. it's, it's very it's very interesting to to think about that. I uh, and, and another question I want to ask you with that, too, with the four components before. Do you have you found or is there any research that you know of of the taking birth control or any birth control um i'd say any birth control formats that you could say contribute to possible infertility later on in life if people are taking that in their teenage years or in their 20s and even for i know women take take those just to be able to regulate their their cycles as well maybe yeah. not even for birth control but to regulate their cycles is there any right. research or anything you could let us in on because right. i feel like there's a um, a lot of misconceptions out there and people thinking that that may have been a cause. Right. There are, um, there had always been concerns that long-term use of birth control pills might decrease subsequent fertility. Uh, it's probably not true. Hmm. There, in fact, because there's an association between use of the pill and a decreased incidence of pelvic infections, pelvic inflammatory disease, it may even be that the pill is slightly protective. The, in years past, intrauterine devices were a major cause of pelvic inflammatory disease. And there were many cases of women who had an IUD, got an infection, their tubes were damaged, and ultimately ended up seeking care uh, because their tubes were blocked or damaged. The current IUDs are incredibly safer and uh, are becoming increasingly popular as a form of birth control. So the early in my career, there were many cases of tubal damage from IUDs. Hardly ever see that anymore. Early in my career, okay. I did 
I did many surgeries for pelvic inflammatory disease, almost never do that anymore. So uh, most of the things that women now use are pretty safe. And, uh, you know, the pill has, if anything, good side effects in terms of ovarian cancer risk, in terms of pelvic inflammatory disease risk. So unlike the past, I'm not so worried about what birth control they used. Good, good. Hopefully that puts a lot of people at uh, at ease then hearing that. Yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you too, is if you're finding this a lot, because I putting myself in in uh, a parent's shoes and they have a, a very they have their first child, well, basically no problem, right? And then they go, let's have a second child, and now all of a sudden they're starting to run into different encounters where maybe there's a, a miscarriage, which I feel like would be devastating to them if they've had yeah. the first child, no problem. Now they're running into pregnancy complications after having a success. And yeah. to me, I would think if I had one success, why am I now, why wouldn't I have had any trouble with that first child? And are you able to give us some, a little bit of insight into what causes some miscarriages? I, I know there's a lot of different reasons why but if there's any patterns that you're seeing and why maybe that happens where you have a successful pregnancy and then you have some trouble in the second or third so several things to say about that the first is uh many women many men have no idea how common miscarriages are it's one thing to have a positive people don't talk about it that's the one thing people do not talk about for sure right so Having an early positive pregnancy test and actually delivering a child, depending on how old you are, there can be anywhere from a 20 to 50% miscarriage rate between those two oh, events. Wow. Uh, again, it's obvious the older you get, the higher the miscarriage rate. And I can say fairly confidently that the number one cause of miscarriage at any age is chromosomal abnormality of the pregnancy. Hmm. It's just that the percentage of miscarriages that are chromosomally abnormal gets higher as a woman gets older. Probably by the time a woman is 40, if she has a miscarriage, 80 to 90% of the time, it's because the tissue was chromosomally abnormal. If you think about it, it's nature's way of protecting her against an abnormal pregnancy. There, mm. You know, you always hear couples talk, and women certainly know this, that as they get older, there's a higher risk of pregnancies like Down syndrome pregnancies. But in fact, the type of pregnancy that continues towards a birth is a tiny percent of the total pregnancies that are abnormal. Most abnormal pregnancies miscarry early in the first you know, weeks of pregnancy, it is the unusual pregnancy that can escape early pregnancy and lead to an abnormal delivery. So even if you're 25 years old and you miscarry, the percentage of miscarriages that are abnormal is much lower, but that's still the most common reason it happens. There are multiple other reasons why miscarriages happen. There's chromosomal reasons that are related to an abnormality parents carry. There are uterine structure reasons. There are infectious disease reasons. There are probably some immunologic reasons, although maybe not as many as people think. Uh, Diabetics have more miscarriages if they have poor control of their diabetes. Two points I'd like to make about it are, number one, one miscarriage is common. It doesn't usually lead to a major evaluation. Even two miscarriages is not that uncommon, given an older woman. So you don't just rush in and do a major evaluation for a miscarriage until some pattern is established. The second thing to say is, from a medical perspective, miscarriages are usually not such major medical events. 
but they're um, tremendously emotional events. Oh, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And the woman may have a miscarriage that happens on its own. It's resolved without any medication or surgery, but she can still be hugely upset by the event, even though medically it wasn't such a big thing. Even a woman who needs a DNC for a miscarriage is more upset by the miscarriage than by the DNC. That so it's important for the doctors to understand that while to the doctor it's not such a big thing, to the patient it's a big thing. Yeah, I feel like the emotional toll isn't really talked about as much as it as the emphasis is on the <laughs> physical body. And are you finding right. that in your in your in your practice too, where people approach you and you're just like, yeah, you know, there's nothing too too seriously wrong just yet. I would say. I mean, you you've had this event, sure, but it's nothing to. I mean, you're you fit in with the majority of women who may have had a miscarriage, right. one or two miscarriages. Right. There, it's very common for doctors to say, particularly after a first miscarriage, to say truthfully. Miscarriages are really common. I'm sorry you had your miscarriage. Go get pregnant again. I'm glad you got pregnant. Let's just see if you can get a good pregnancy. Um, it's medically correct. You just have to say it to a patient in a way that she feels comforted. For me, as a fertility doctor, I don't tend to see miscarriage patients until they have had several miscarriages. Mm. And the only thing I would say is because chromosomal abnormality is the most common reason, we are very helped by knowing whether or not a miscarriage was chromosomally abnormal. So when someone has a DNC, a surgical procedure to finish a miscarriage, that tissue can be sent for chromosomal analysis. It's important to me to know whether the tissue that a woman has been miscarrying, the pregnancy she's been miscarrying, is chromosomally normal or not. If it's chromosomally abnormal, it's, so to speak, a correct miscarriage, and I can talk to her about ways to try to get a more chromosomally normal pregnancy. If it's normal tissue that she's miscarrying. Ultimately, you start looking for these other more rare causes. Mm. So on a first pregnancy, it's very common that no evaluation is done. On a second one, I'd love to see the chromosomal normalcy check, but even there, it's often not done. It usually sometimes takes a third miscarriage before the antenna go up and more evaluation work is done. Okay. Well, I have a, um, that's interesting. That's interesting. It plays right into a role of uh, the next question I wanted to ask you, because I have uh, someone who reached out. This is a, a kind of, I'd say like a case scenario, probably a, a case you probably have had before. And what they're asking is, A, what causes a missed miscarriage? And if you can explain to people really what a missed miscarriage is, and how does one having endometriosis affect fertility? Uh, two almost separate topics. Separate, yeah, yeah, separate. Right. We'll go one at one the, the other. The word missed miscarriage is a holdover from the years in the past when you could not hear a fetal heart till you were about three to four months pregnant. So very often a woman would get that far and then you couldn't hear the heartbeat and you'd say, oh, it's a miscarriage, but I missed it because I couldn't hear it until you were this far along. Nowadays, because of ultrasound, terms continues, but actually we know way earlier in pregnancy. Mm -hmm. It means that there is no heartbeat in the pregnancy or there is no fetal pole in the pregnancy, but there is still a pregnancy. It's just inevitable that it's going to miscarry. So people say, oh, that's a missed miscarriage, or sometimes they'll say it's a missed abortion. But it's really not missed. 
It's just recognize that the pregnancy is not good. It's just the miss used to be much longer in time frames when we didn't have early ways of detecting heartbeats. Got so um, nobody, so to speak, has missed anything. What's missing is the heartbeat. The endometriosis is an internal condition of the reproductive organs, and it can be even more than that in rare cases. Uh, the endometrium is the lining of the uterus. Every month when a woman gets her period, she sheds the endometrium. But there are certain immunologic factors that probably allow endometrial tissue to implant where it's not supposed to be. And when it implants where it's not supposed to be, it's called endometriosis if that's outside the uterus. It can also be called adenomyosis if it's in the wall of the uterus. And endometriosis can cause infertility in two ways. It can cause it structurally because the body reacts to endometriosis tissue and can form scar tissue. The endometriosis can be in the ovary and form endometriosis cysts, often called chocolate cysts because the inside has the consistency of chocolate pudding. And they structurally interfere with how the ovary works or how the tubes work. But there are also a variety of humoral and immunologic factors that the endometriosis exerts in the pelvic cavity that interferes with the normal functioning of egg and sperm and meeting up and fertilizing. So endometriosis, some people think, can affect up to 20% of couples who have infertility. But much of it is what's called a cult, that the woman doesn't actually know she has it, that in fact her presenting complaint is her infertility. But there are other women who long before fertility is ever a problem have all sorts of pelvic pain and discomfort from their endometriosis. And it's a problem for them and their gynecologist unrelated to infertility. I should say, though, some women with endometriosis do manage to get pregnant on their own. It's not an absolute barrier, but on a percentage basis, it's harder to get pregnant if you have endometriosis than if you don't. Mm, and if they if that didn't come up with their gynecologist when they were younger, do you generally see them them seeing you, and that's when it gets discovered as to why they may be experiencing some infertility? It's a very subtle issue. Years ago, before there was IVF, if a woman was having trouble getting pregnant, she would have certain basic tests done, including checking that her tubes and uterus were okay. Her partner would have a semen analysis. There were certain blood hormonal tests that were checked. And if at that point nothing had turned up, virtually every patient had an operative procedure called the laparoscopy, where they look through the belly button with a telescope to visually see the uterus tubes and ovaries to see if they're normal or have unsuspected scar tissue or endometriosis implants. As the success rate of IVF has gone up over the years, fewer and fewer women are having the laparoscopy because the pregnancy rates are higher from an IVF cycle than they are from the surgical correction of the endometriosis. So mm -hmm. laparoscopies have become less common. And They're IVF only has done... become way more common. <laughs> right. IVF is way more common not because laparoscopy is disreputable, it's not. It's because IVF is more efficient. So intentionally, infertility doctors are overlooking endometriosis unless the patient has some particular reason, uh, which is probably beyond the scope of this talk, but to go looking for it. But usually, in the absence of what's called bulk disease, that you see it in the ovaries, you can feel it, most women do not have laparoscopies. And if they're not pregnant and their tests don't show anything, 
or they have some other reason for their endometriosis, they end up with either inseminations or IVF, but they don't have a laparoscopy. Hmm. Oh, I'm glad you brought up IVF because I'd love to chat about some treatment options yeah. that you that you have seen have had the most success. And since you brought it up, is in vitro the one that you would say generally people who you work with that you can confirm, yeah, they are experiencing fertility for whatever reason. Is that one that you generally um, end up recommending or are there others too that people can be susceptible to also be? Um, I would answer that this way. IVF, one month of IVF makes more babies than any other intervention, no matter the age of the woman. Hmm. In other words, you can't compare natural conception to IVF. If I said to you that 90% of 21-year-olds would be pregnant within a year on their own, what you remember is the 90 or 95%. But in fact, an IVF cycle in a 21-year-old would probably get 60 or 65% of them pregnant in one month. So oh, wow. in a month, IVF is more efficient than anything else you can do. By natural conception, even if a 21-year-old got pregnant 20 or 30% of the time in one month, it's still not as good as one IVF cycle. Because IVF has that type of efficiencies now, it is the final common pathway of almost anything that could be wrong with you. If the sperm don't work and other things you do like inseminations don't fix it, you'll go to IVF. If your tubes are damaged or blocked and even if you had a surgical procedure to fix it, it doesn't work. IVF is the final common pathway. If nothing's wrong, what's called idiopathic infertility, unexplained infertility, if empiric treatments, the tablet fertility drugs, clomid, letrozole, inseminations, don't get you pregnant, ultimately you're going to be doing IVF. What's changed over the years is that it used to be IVF was the last thing you did. You would try everything oh, really? else for as long as you could do it because IVF success rates were so low, you know, back in the 1980s and even early 90s. And it was expensive. There was almost nobody oh, had insurance okay. for That's it. probably why, yeah. But now... It's the most successful thing you can do. It has the best efficiencies. So couples tend to go to IVF faster and faster and faster and faster. We don't waste time making a career of infertility treatment. That's, I'm not saying that IVF always works. It's just more efficient in getting the patients pregnant than would happen on its own. And and with IVF, you're basically removing an egg, fertilizing it with sperm, and then returning the egg, which would then be the embryo, back into the woman's um, the womb. Yep, in simple terms, exactly. Yes. And and I'm sure people hearing just one month, <laughs> that's probably hitting light bulbs off because timing, when people are trying to get pregnant, they are trying to get pregnant right now. Actually, that's a very important point. We often talk about it because either the family physician or even the insurance company will act as if time doesn't matter. But to a couple that's trying to get pregnant, yeah. time matters. And if you said, well, you might get pregnant over the next year or two on your own, or you know, for a woman in her mid-30s, I can get 40 or 50 percent of you pregnant in one month. Which do you think the patient would do? Yeah, All other yeah, things yeah, yeah. being equal. <laughs> so time does matter and it has real value to the patients. Yeah, and time is everything. And I feel like people too who end up choosing embryo freezing probably are absolutely thinking of time. And I'd love to 
get your yeah. thoughts on that too on if you're seeing women approach you with that goal in mind and is and if you are recommending it to someone and at what age do you think is most appropriate too because everything in society if you were to compare us to people 30 40 50 years ago there's like a 5 to 10 year delay on everything when it comes to buying homes getting people people's forever jobs getting married which then obviously the last thing after all of that is having kids and by the time people are now having kids and seriously considering let's get pregnant i mean we're talking probably like low 30s mid 30s at this point and are you seeing a big shift with people now considering freezing their eggs in comparison to historical oh absolutely uh the mean age at the delivery of a first child has been rising steadily for years. Uh, even over the last five or 10 years, it's been creeping up. I'm in New York, and for sure, women and couples are delaying childbearing because of careers and work in New York. So egg freezing is increasingly popular, and it's now really popular because many employers are offering coverage for egg freezing. Uh, it started in the technology companies and then to keep their employees, many in the financial services or law firms, had to start matching those benefits to not have women go to another company to get the benefit. So egg freezing is certainly a way to try to protect yourself against the future. Although I always stress, even to the patients who come in for egg freezing, that my advice always is to not delay childbearing too long. That to, when you think about pregnancy, it should be at the earliest socially acceptable moment, not the latest you can put it off. Because as you get to your mid, late 30s, early 40s, fertility starts to actually drop seriously. And you may have a batch of eggs frozen, but that batch of eggs is never guaranteed to get you pregnant. It's always a percentage basis. And therefore, it's important if it's a choice between getting pregnant three years from now and two years from now, I say do it in two years. If it's between four years and five years, do it in four years. Use the earliest opportunity to get pregnant. Egg freezing is more efficient the younger you are when you freeze your eggs. What you're balancing when you freeze eggs is the quality of the eggs, namely the younger you are when they freeze, the better the eggs, versus the chance you'll ever need to use the eggs. I often joke if we froze the eggs of every 21-year-old in America, we'd have the best eggs ever frozen but most of the women would never need them because they're fated to get pregnant on their own. And at yeah. the other extreme, if I froze the eggs of every 44-year-old, they'd all need them. The problem would be the eggs would be horrible for most mm. of them. That's a good point. So you've got to freeze early enough to have good quality, but there are women who freeze their eggs and then never use them as well. Oh, really? Right, because they don't either they don't need them or they decide at a later point in life they're not prepared to be pregnant. Hmm. That is interesting because I would think that if somebody is taking that proactive step with their health to freeze their eggs, that there is some uh, uh, some sort of important idea or thought that they did they want to bear children. So it's interesting that if they actually never end up doing it, because that is a that is a pretty definitive and intentional step to do so. I, I would think that hmm. absolutely. And in fact, when we realized the percent who weren't using their eggs, we were surprised until we thought about it. And I think women do this to protect themselves. They realize it's a way to partially protect themselves. And that makes sense. And oh, the just more like eggs a just you, in case. Mm. Right. The more eggs you freeze, the better. But sometimes the woman who's 37 years old and not ready to get pregnant who freezes eggs goes through life for the next five or 10 years and realizes that motherhood was not on the agenda and the eggs remain unused. Uh, we've spoken to many of those patients and a lot of them say to us, you know, I know I didn't use them, 
but I've slept better all these years knowing, knowing they were had. there. That I feel like after speaking about that right now, then it should almost become a thing or a normal thing to then like in the mid twenties, I guess, if you're just working your life away, working, 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 and you, you know, there hasn't really been a lot of romantic kinships to start considering maybe um, do that option because it is proactive. And when you're proactive, that is you're giving yourself the best opportunities. It's, it's definitely something to think about. I think even general family doctors, internists, certainly obstetrician gynecologists, if they see a patient who's, let's say, 30 years old, and that patient is not pregnant, has no children, and is not planning on children for a while, maybe ever, but for a while, to bring up the topic and say, have you considered freezing your eggs? Because sometimes uh, the thought that really doesn't occur to the 30-year-old, although I will tell you with social media and insurance coverage, the women are becoming more and more aware of the possibility. Yeah, that's part of the reason why, too, I want to uh, do this podcast, too, is because the worst thing in the world, I think, is when something has elapsed or has gone, has finished, and it's now too late. You know, that that I feel yeah. like is always is never a feeling right. you want somebody to feel, especially in today's information driven, yeah. obsessive world where everything's at our fingertips. And if if you're in these situations, you really should know. And I feel like gynecologists, especially who have worked with their patients over the course of years, this yeah. should be something absolutely I'd love to have right. them. As you could imagine, discussing. I've had many women come to freeze their eggs, let's say, in their late 30s, early 40s, which is fine. And it doesn't go quite as well as they expected. Mm. And they'll say to me, I should have done this years ago. I don't know why I waited. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that, that's gotta be one of the toughest conversations you you have with, with people I'm sure. Right. Yep. Yeah. And it, it's hard to correct at that point. Yeah. Your, your job is very, very fascinating because it's, yeah. you are really, helping families become families. I can only imagine like the ups and downs that roller coaster can be, which has got to be like equivalent of like what, right. what someone goes through during a pregnancy, which right. is like all of a sudden that they have the happiest moment of their life. They're, they're pregnant. They're finally having a child. And then a, a miscarriage happens a couple months down the road, but then you're there to say, no, 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 right. Relax, relax. This is common. This is, you're not one of one of one. You're one of many women experiencing this. One point I'd like to make about age is because I've had women say this to me. They'll say, I'm in great shape. How could I be having this problem? Or I, my ovaries are in great shape. I'm making lots of eggs. How come I'm not getting pregnant? And what you have to recognize is that as all women get older, again, in my world, particularly in their mid, late 30s, early, mid 40s, the percentage of their embryos that are chromosomally normal gets lower and lower and lower. So I have patients in their 40s who make lots of eggs in response to the fertility drugs we use. But the percentage of their embryos that turn out to be normal is very low. Mm. So I might be able to get 20 eggs from a 30-year-old and 20 eggs from a 40-year-old. The difference is that at 30 years old, half the embryos are normal. And at 40 years old, a quarter of the embryos are normal. And by the way, by 45 years old, only one in 20 embryos is normal. So the fact that a woman can make eggs, and even a lot of eggs, and be in otherwise good health, doesn't change the fact that a qualitative issue is occurring over the course of time that can't be fixed. And that's why the success rates of everything I do fall as women get older. It's not necessarily because they don't have eggs. It's that they don't have eggs that can get them pregnant. Oh, gotcha. So there's that misconception that I do have eggs, but it's just they have to be the ones that can get them pregnant. I uh, I have to ask you, since we're talking about women at, women aging and, and that affecting their ability to get pregnant, do when men age... Does that also play a role as well with the health 
of the child down the road because um i mean just i just recently uh i think it was like two days ago actually robert it came out robert de niro at 79 is it has fathered a child and i've got to think i mean if robert de niro was 25 in comparison to 79 is there a difference between the possibility of health complications during the pregnancy or after the baby's born just based off of sheer age with men or, or does that really not play a role no it does play some role the first thing is the average quality of a semen analysis does decrease with age it's just unlike women where let's say somewhere between 40 and 50 years old most women can no longer get pregnant with men they can still have a sperm count that can get a woman pregnant really into their 80s. You know, the other thing is, even if the sperm count is very, very low, you could still do in vitro fertilization and make those sperm work, even if they wouldn't work in nature, so to speak. Mm. So as long as they're sperm, we can make them work. It may require in vitro. The other thing to say is there is an association with advanced paternal age and autism spectrum diseases. So uh, sometimes you'll hear it expressed as, uh, as men are over 40 years old and they father children, the incidence of uh, autism spectrum problems uh, doubles. It's not quite that dramatic. You know, it's probably below age 40, it's maybe 1%, above age 40, maybe it's 2%. So although it may be doubling, it's still not quite as dramatic yeah. as they say, but there is an association of increased paternal age and the risk of autism spectrum in children. Well, I love our uh, conversation before about being proactive and getting ahead of things, especially, and that, and the autism link with older men fathering child too is an interesting one that I'd love to chat about uh, the genetic diagnosis of embryos, because I feel like it, that is a proactive measure people can take that can possibly come up with some right. of these uh, health causes way early on. And is, is a, what is my question for you would be a, what is ge the genetic di diagnosis of embryos in, in your opinion? Oh. And B, what are you guys able to, really get out of it and determine from a health standpoint what diseases you can um, find prior to the child being born? Okay. I'll try to be as short as I can be on this answer. The embryos, not eggs, embryos can be tested for genetic normalcy. There's two types of genetic testing in general that get done. The most common is what's called PGTA, pre-implantation genetic testing, and the A stands for the word aneuploidy, meaning the count of chromosomes. Uh, most people know that there are 46 chromosomes, 23 from your mother, 23 from your father, and if there's an abnormality of count, something will be wrong with the baby. So you can count the chromosomes of an embryo by taking a microbiopsy from the embryo, from the cells that are fated to be the placenta, not the cells that are going to be the fetus, and count the chromosomes of that embryo. The, and you will find, as I already mentioned, that the older the woman, the higher the percent of the embryos are abnormal. Mm. But when you do that, you are basically 99 plus percent preventing things like Down syndrome pregnancies because the testing picks up the 47th chromosome that's present in Down syndrome pregnancies. And there are others like that, but most people know about Down syndrome the most. Separate from the general chromosomal testing, which becomes more important as a woman gets older and the percent of her embryos that are abnormal gets higher, is what's called carrier screening. And if I have one plea to everyone, it's to have carrier screening even before you're pregnant rather than wait until you're pregnant, until it's done. Carry, 
you can carry a disease and not have the disease. The most common one is cystic fibrosis. But there's Tay-Sachs, sickle, spinal muscular atrophy, fragile X, all sorts of diseases. And the number of diseases that can be checked has gone up. The current uh, profiles probably check about 550 or 60 diseases. If you're a carrier, most of the time that makes no difference. What we're trying to avoid is two carriers meeting up, each giving their carrier gene to their child and the child actually having the disease. If we know that's the circumstance, we can not only test the embryo for its chromosome count, we can actually check the embryo for that specific disease. It's a little more complicated, but it can be done. And you can prevent you can use an embryo that doesn't have the disease. It might be a carrier, but it doesn't have the disease. And therefore, the couple is never faced with delivering a child with that disease or faced with the decision to abort the pregnancy because the child has that particular disease, if it's a bad disease. You can test for things more subtle than single gene diseases, like hair color and eye color. We don't do it. We think it's unnecessary, but it is out there. Uh, there is a lot of information you can have. It's important to state we can't yet totally prevent things like hypertension, diabetes, autism, which are multifactorial or multigenic, meaning there's much that contributes to them happening. So I can't run a test for autism. Mm. I can't run a test for diabetes the way I can run a test for cystic fibrosis. So the fact that I might be able to change the incidence of diabetes from 17% uh, to 24% or 24% to 17% is not yet such a big advance. There may come a time down the road where we can hone in on individual diseases like that more accurately. It's out there. It's just not as efficient or exact as the science for the chromosomes or the single genes. And you refer to that as carrier testing. You, that's what it would right. be called, people going. And you could do that with men and women. Oh, absolutely. In fact, you have to. If Let's say of these 550 diseases, a woman has three positives. We have to test the man to see if he has the say, any one of those three same positives. Mm. I don't care if they both have five diseases each, as long as they don't different. have the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That they don't have the same one. The other thing you can do with genetic diseases, this will be my last comment about it, is that there are some diseases that families know they carry and they don't want it transmitted to the next generation like the BRCA gene for breast cancer. And the you know families that carry the gene are incredibly distressed about it. You can electively go through in vitro fertilization and test the embryos for the BRCA gene and know that you're not passing it on to the next generation. So once you can, once a disease has had its gene identified, we can prevent. I feel like the average person, like myself included, we're so far behind on what really is out there in knowledge. Like we don't know that that I feel like the majority of people have never heard of carrier testing. You know, something that that is so uh, you would say, I mean, 10, 15 years ago would be like futuristic. Right. This type of carrier testing is only approximately 10 years old. It was first mostly adopted by fertility programs because we work with embryos where we could prevent the disease. It's only in the last few years that it's become more common for obstetrician gynecologists to do the carrier testing. The problem is they often wait until the woman is pregnant to do it. Mm. And even if they then find out that husband and wife carry the same disease and they do a CVS or an amniocentesis to test whether or not the pregnancy is affected, the couple can face a decision of whether or not to abort the pregnancy. So I always feel that the best chance to prevent that type of scenario 
is to do the testing as soon as the woman says, I'm ready to get pregnant. Yeah, because at that point, you confirm that my child does have cystic fibrosis, and that is the child you are bearing, rather than, right. like you're saying, ahead of time, knowing uh, which right. diseases you can not. Right. You We're know. more into prevention than dealing with it after the fact. Yeah. No, that's 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 a really great point. That's a really great point. That's why planning, I mean, in all phases of life, especially in here, is uh very important. I uh I, I appreciate your uh your thoughts on that, Dr. Berkeley. I have some uh some information here on the bottom of the screen if you're watching on YouTube that people can find. Um they could find your your practice and some information. But where where would you say if somebody is experiencing some infertility, maybe you want to after listening to this, go, yeah, actually I would consider myself in that category as a future patient to go and 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 see you is there any any place you would say they can go and find you uh yes i work at the nyu langone fertility center uh not only myself uh my partners are wonderful physicians and we do have um an instagram for our practice that's called fertility and why Fertility underscore NY on yes. Instagram. Yep. That's on Instagram also that they can get that feed as well. Perfect. That sounds, uh, that sounds perfect. Yes. And I'll put some information too. If you guys are listening on like Spotify or Apple, right yeah. in the description there where people can find the, uh, the website and where to find and just get a, even just a consultation is always, uh, always just a great starting point, you know, to kind of find out if, if, you know, your, your fears are really fearful or if maybe you should just keep trying. So, uh, I, I thank you so much for your time, Dr. Berkeley. It's been, it's been great. And, uh, their website is right in the description, guys, feel free to comment or send me a message if you have any questions. And, um, Dr. Berkeley, I, I appreciate, I am so looking forward to linking up down the road and we oh, can great. talk, uh, talk more about some more future treatment options that maybe have been even created or even more well-established. Hey, thank you so much for having me on the program. Thank you, Dr. Brogan. We will, we'll chat soon.